Mutina Tatar, Talo Falava, Assalamu Alaikum. We're nearing the end of the day, but we have two massive topics uh, to discuss uh, economic justice and climate justice, and we have a wonderful panel of powerful, knowledgeable women uh, to discuss this. Um, I have to say that as a daughter of the Pacific, this is a topic that really strikes a chord with me because in the Pacific, we contribute the least to climate change, yet we suffer um, some of the most serious impacts. And that is true mm. of indigenous and tribal peoples all around the world. We have lived sustainably with the environment for thousands of years. And in addition, some of our traditional ways created thriving economies and the opportunity for our peoples to live productive and creative lives. And unfortunately, the loss of our languages and our traditional ways through colonization has been a constraint on economic development. So for our penultimate session of the day, we now have um, this wonderful panel who are applying traditional wisdom to solve modern day problems. And here to talk about centering indigenous and tribal people's worldviews in the movement towards economic and climate justice, we have uh, Carrie Jo Lawrence, Executive Director of the Intertribal Agricultural Council from the USA. Hello Turning Heart, Program Director of the Uchi Language Project from the USA. And Billy Jo Hohepa Ropiha, Founder and Visionary of Bidei from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, to borrow a phrase from Dr. Hinemoa Elder, um, I'm just going to invite the panel to introduce themselves and to um, place themselves on the Indigenous continuum. So, let's start with you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Carrie Jo Lawrence, and uh, like she said, I'm the Executive Director of the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I am originally from North Dakota. I'm a member of the Mandan Hidatsa Rikara Nation. And um, my mother is a Standing Rock Sioux tribal citizen, and I was raised in my, my Hidatsa uh, culture. So, so that's, I guess, when, we, when I talk about the things that I've done in the past or, or how my family functions, it's through the, the uh, Hidatsa culture. Thank you. Hello. Fasa Anze Sala, De Pole Anze, De Gautwe De Yujihale Shtahae. Nande Yujiha Keda, Zoyaha Keda, Seminole Hade, Ze Shodase, Nande Zio Toto Ina, Yujiha E Leo de Gautwe De, Nagaka Leo de Gautwe De, Afa E, Gototo de Le Ina, O Yutundadi Sha. I'm Halle Turning Heart with the Yuchi Language Project in Oklahoma in the US and my role is as a language healer, as a mother, uh, an apprentice, and also a teacher of our Yuchi language and working to revitalize our ceremonies and worldview through our language and immersion program. Sanlake Asuta. Tēnā koutou katsua, no te mahure hure, no ngāpuhi, te rarua, te atiawa, me te iwi Wampanoag ki Massachusetts. Aho, ko Billy Jo Hohe Baropiha, tōku ingwa. My name is Billy Jo Hohe Baropiha, and I am a mother of four, and I like long walks along the beach. Thank you. Kia ora. Awesome. Um, now, as one of the previous speakers said, um, our indigenous languages are a gift from the gods. So I'm going to start off with Hele. Um, in your experience, how can revitalizing indigenous language help the movement towards climate justice? Well, I've seen that our languages are actually from the land and they grow out of the land and cannot be separated from the land they originate in. And so when we think about protecting our lands, we must also think about protecting our languages. And our languages carry the key to um, understanding how to live sustainably in these local ecosystems as we have for millennia. So that's part of my work as I work with youth, how to connect them to the land, to their traditional foods, raising crops, their diet, and restoring the health of our people. Um, through wellness and our connection to the land and language. So, mm. Thank you for that. Um, 
So now turning to Kerry Jo, you've spent your career caring for the land. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your work and how conserving and developing agricultural resources contributes to the betterment of your peoples? Absolutely. Well, I, I'm going to go back to how I started my career. I worked for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is an arm of the, of the USDA. I worked there for 20 years. I was a soil conservationist, and then I moved up in, into a leadership role. And just a few years ago, I came home to the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I was one of the original scholarship recipients. And I just wanted to further the impact that, that I was having with producers and the way that we are producing food. Um, so a little bit of history about the Intertribal Ag Council. It came to be uh, November 19th, 1987. In a couple of days, it's going to be our 34th birthday. But it, um, we, were, we came to be because of trying to figure out what was going on in Indian agriculture back in the 1980s. It was during the farm crisis. There was several things happening with, uh, with the weather, and things were going wrong. And everybody else was surviving. Tribal people were losing their land, and losing their, their egg businesses, and not doing well. So it came uh, together and um, just trying to figure out what was going on in Indian agriculture. And the, you know, we were bringing people together to try to advocate for, for change at the, at, the, um, at the USDA and congressional level to make some changes so, for inclusion so that Indian land could be included in, in programming. It's interesting. So when things started going wrong, you turned to traditional ways of being to help solve a problem. Yeah, get together and what is going on here and what do we need to do to solve it all across Indian country. Um, the IAC represents all 574 tribes and Alaska Native villages. So we have a wide array of issues, uh, a wide array of what we you know, dub is agriculture, but that, that can mean so many different things. And it's uh, each, each tribe has their own definition of agriculture, even if they call it agriculture or not. It's, um, we have our own ways of producing food, and it's our job to listen to what the issues are and to um, have a unified voice when we have things to bring to the, to the congressional level to try to make change, positive change. Um, turn, turning now to Billy Jo, um, so your company uh, creates eco-friendly products. How did your whakapapa and your genealogy contribute to um, starting your company? Um, kia ora. <clears throat> well, in a way, it was because I suppose a lot of that business knowledge and trading knowledge had been taken away from us. Um, I know my, my father, he grew up with... Um, cows and that was what they did but they only had a herd of 20 back in the day they changed the rules so that you had to have uh, a bigger herd and so that's th th that that extra revenue that income um got taken away from so many in um in our valley in our community and we had uh micro businesses in in our areas that were just basically taken out through policy or how uh, how the movement of business went. And therefore, we saw that urban drift, um, just like Alfano, um, to the metropolis of Moirua, where uh, mo most of my whānau worked at Freezing Works. Mm -hmm. So we were bereft in the knowledge of business uh, for me, it was going back and learning that and filling that void so that we could bridge um, from what I'd like to say. I come from tutus, tutupreneurs, um, basically people who turn um, things from the dump into something else. That was that's kind of my background. So going from inventors and I come from a long line of inventors but how do we how do we bridge that gap and make money and make an economy for our community our hapu our iwi um, and that's where I felt I needed to to 
to do that mahi on a micro level, I suppose, building that gap. Knowledge. And how did you relearn uh, that knowledge that was lost? I that thought, entrepreneurial knowledge. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. So I did my MBA <clears throat> and it was tr purely around, um, uh, well, actually, I wanted to be CEO of Māori Television, Shane's job out the back, um, <laughs> because that's what we knew. We, we worked for other people. But when I got further into the MBA and, re and, and learned all these amazing tools and put them in my kit here, that's when I realised, hang on, I want to take our inventions, our ideas, and make a business out of it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, as Ngahiwi was uh, talking about earlier this morning, um, our peoples were traders. Uh, so how do we reinvigorate those trade routes uh, and those um, ancient ways of being? So I'm going to turn to Hele now. Um, how does language revitalization help in terms of um, self-sufficiency and economic development? Oh, San Lakiasuta. Chasochi Gabi, now wahale on you, da la in te gan. Chaso sahande omage, na ate la in te gan. So, in one um, context, we have our, our language work, which is a nonprofit, and many of our uh, programs are nonprofit, which means we're constantly looking for a means to fund salaries and a space and those kind of things. Um, but it means with these grant cycles, outside entities are often dictating our work. So they have requirements, they have a framework of how things should run that um, is dictating the way we work instead of being self-determined and designing our own, uh, empowering our own people to run our own programs. And that's something I'd really like to see is uh, more for-profit, indigenous um, organizations and the ability to generate our own economies but base them in our indigenous values instead of extractive um, what we often see as extractive in the mainstream but to really ba uh, base them in our language and a lot of that knowledge is you know it's from our ancestors the way they lived on the land and the way that um, they related to one another. And I think that's the way uh, forward for our language work to create partners that are willing to assist us in this work without um, being heavy handed in how things should run on a local level. Uh, can I turn now to um, Carrie Jo just um, to talk a little bit about um, extractive and regenerative practices? Sure. Um, so I, I think regenerative, we were, we were talking about it in the back there. Um, it's, it's something that I would like everybody in this room and everybody who listens to this talk and pass it on. I would like to see us not let anybody define re what regenerative means to us to our individual tribes, to our individual communities. I feel that regenerative needs to remain with us and have that self, um, self-defined. What does that mean to us? Um, like right now, we're working on a regenerative economies program, and in, it goes hand in hand with the regenerative agriculture program that we are also deploying out into Indian country because we believe that if we cannot afford to be well in, in our egg practices, it's, it's hard to um, give back to, to the resource as well. So food, economies, regenerative, um, it, it all goes together. It's, it's an it's a ecosystem level way of thinking and operating and Recreating our, our food systems that have, you know, were created by, by all of our, our ancestors thousands and thousands of years ago. So we want to continue to have that be the choice of each of our communities. 
I just want to touch on your um, personal um, experiences throughout your career, Carrie Jo. Um, throughout your journey, you've often served in roles that have been historically underserved by Indigenous people. So what do you think needs to change at the systems level to ensure that there are more Indigenous and tribal peoples in leadership roles who are able to advocate uh, for our traditional ways? Well, I think we need to connect the pipeline. At the Intertribal Aid Council, and I know a lot of other organizations have a professional development arm, a youth development arm, and we know where these dynamo stars are at. They're, they're amazing at what they do. They have the great new ideas. They, you know, they have a vast interest that um, will all contribute to our ecosystems level um, solutions. And I would like to see the, the government, the, the companies out there who are looking for those dynamos, who don't know where they are, we do. Let's get connected. I would love to uh, connect that pipeline. You know, so there's opportunity and then there's people looking for that opportunity. We can, we can make those connections. So reach out to organizations like us. Uh, Billy Joe, uh, in your experience as an entrepreneur, uh, what are the characteristics you bring as a Maori woman that give you an advantage in the world of commerce? Um, <clears throat> you have to be really good at rejection and a lot of no's. Um, it was quite interesting because you talked about climate justice and I actually had to Google it and um, kind of at the essence of climate justice is really if there are solutions to reducing climate change, then why are they not being implemented? And that so speaks to my heart right now. I've created a product that is a solution for councils and I started this three years ago. My message and my solution has always remained the same. And yet, just yesterday, I got my second, only second, out of 79 councils in New Zealand, support. But only a letter. I got a support letter. No real commitment, but a letter that says, I know Billy Joe's products will reduce single-use plastic that is very much a problem for our council and we support her. So yeah, you must be very uh, resilient and you have to be happy with lots of no's, but keep going, this is what we do. So what we do is mana wahine. And do you find that your culture helps you to build that resilience? Uh, my humour does, and my culture makes me grounded. I know where I'm from, I know who I am, I have that connection, that umbilical cord to my land that no one else will ever own, and that is always, always keeps me grounded. Mm. Yep. Hello. Um, in terms of building communities that are thriving economically and are uh, um, self-sufficient. How do you think language contributes to that? I think especially I see in my own life that knowing the language has opened so many doors and it opens the door for education. Um, I think it's something that can really set students apart and it's, uh, it's it acts in two ways, both the local knowledge and the wealth of knowledge that's really invaluable, but also opening doors on the economic sphere, uh, you know, higher education, job positions, um, and networking, just ways to enter um, different spheres that wouldn't have been possible. And that I felt the confidence, and I've seen it in our youth, um, through the language you have the foundation to really become anyone you want to be, to do anything you want to do, and to do it through our values and um, in a sustainable way. And uh, one of my favorite um, stories, one of our elders who spoke the language fluently took our youth out to see, you know, the prairie and the woods and said, you know, what do you see? 
And they said, I don't know, I just see some trees and grass. But the elder saw medicines, foods, all of these things that you only see through the language and growing up that way. And so there's just a, a lens of another world that's opened up. And I think investing in that, giving youth that, is an invaluable contribution to our future, to climate justice, as well as economic sustainability for our indigenous peoples. So, thank you. I think you um, summed that up really nicely. So I've got my final question, which I'm going to ask uh, all of you. For our audience sitting out there today, what's one thing that they can do to further the movement towards economic justice or climate justice? Let's improve the diversity in leadership. And going back to the question you asked earlier, how can we make sure there is real systems change? If we have the companies government saying, we're going to make these changes, why don't we see it part of their business metrics? Let's have it measurable. Let's have it consequences if they don't meet their goals. Um, let's make it happen. That, I think that's uh, a step in the right direction. It would be. Wonderful. What you can measure, you can change. L.A.? Oh, yeah, I agree with what's been said here. And... Um, I would just add, you know, encourage each of us uh, to look at our own lifestyle. And a lot of times through the language work, we see a, a change, a, a needed change in our own lifestyle. You know, are we using the plastic disposables and that kind of thing? All of these things that are separating us from our, our lands and our purpose. So I think there are so many things on a personal level and then on a larger scale, you know, to support indigenous entrepreneurs, to support those sustainable indigenous companies that are making a difference, um, and to train youth, you know, build capacity, empower the youth to make their own decisions, to analyze the future and see a different future than the path we're on now, because we know we need uh, change. So, San Lake Asuta. Yeah, absolutely. On a micro and macro level, there's much change that is needed, but there's also support, um, innovation, which is not uh, highlighted or supported by our Indigenous um, leaders and governments and iwi level. Um, it's really hard as a Indigenous entrepreneur and wahine at that, um, you know, the barriers, I can tell you, are, are huge. And it's not easy. And um, they are fraught with many hurdles from trying to get a loan. And you actually have assets because you are supposed to fail in two years' time. So we will come back in five years' time and see if you're still operating the attitudes are that you will fail. And until we move together and we support those that are coming up, all they will see is how hard it is. And for me, I have to succeed. I seriously have to succeed in what I do so that I pass, make a pathway for others, other Māori, Indigenous, to show that, yeah, it's, it, can be, it can be done and we need to support one another. Yeah, I think that's a, a great note to end it on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the call to action from our panellists. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>